All right, everyone, uh, we're going to get into our second class. And uh, we're not actually going to go into any hands-on hacking in this class. We're going to go all the way up to that, where we talk a little bit about surveillance that pretty much anyone can do with their own computer. Uh, you might not, depending on your type of uh, wireless card, even need to buy another piece of hardware in order to do some of this stuff. But we'll walk you through the framework through which uh, we will be using this information and why it's valuable. Now, one question I get when I teach people about like uh, wireless surveillance techniques or Wi-Fi hacking is, why is this information useful? So in order to understand that, we're going to get a little bit into uh, advanced persistent threat methodology. So what that means is uh, this is the kind of methodology that people who have a lot of resources and a lot of time and a lot of personnel and a lot of technical skills are able to use. And the reason they use them is because they're almost always effective. So given enough time and given enough uh, opportunity, an advanced persistent threat will tend to be successful against even the most well-defended of targets. So uh, to understand why that works, let's take a look at what advanced persistent threats like to do. So these sorts of tactics that we're going to go into are really good for penetration testing. Uh, now, penetration testing is uh, when you are paid to basically simulate an attacker and go into a business and uh, try to break into their network or otherwise do something that an attacker might do. Now, when we're using these sorts of techniques for penetration testing, which is legal, um, like hacking, which is what we're learning about, you need to understand that advanced persistent threats and penetration testers using advanced persistent threat tactics are still different. So uh, many of the methods that APT groups use uh, are not legal. Uh, and they're difficult to defend against because when you have uh, an attacker who has infinite chances to strike and then a defender who only needs to make one mistake, the equation is really stacked against the defender. Uh, so this can take significant time and resources. One limitation to trying to use APT tactics is that uh, if you don't have the time to stick around and really go after a particular target for a long period of time, these tactics don't really work. Um, the majority of uh, hackers that are kind of mid-tier skill, they go after the easiest stuff they can find because it means that they can either hit a target, make a payday for whatever, however they make money and move on, and not really go after one persistent target for a long period of time. Now, APTs are um, big thinking. Like, they generally have a larger plan. Um, there's something bigger than just like a small financial crime involved. So typically, their plans will have multiple layers, and it will take significant time and resources uh, to invest uh, in making it succeed. So uh, when we look at penetration testers, this is the legal version uh, of an APT. This is what we would be hoping to reasonably simulate against a business that's paying us to determine whether or not that they're an uh, an easy target for somebody using these method, uh, methods. So I'm going to show you guys a small, a short little uh, clip of penetration testers breaking into the US power grid and some of the different techniques that they use in order to do so. And you'll notice that some of these techniques do not look legal because they uh, kind of aren't. And I'm not going to see if I can get some sound. Basically, anything that could ruin a company, we try to access. So we're about oh, to God. hit up it's a, a power beginning. substation. Sorry. Live demos are always a bad idea. I don't know if you guys are. Uh, knew that. But if I can skip through a little bit, things like lock picking, um, getting into a company uh, as a student and getting a tour, uh, being able to uh, walk around a business and see where all the computers are located, or even getting a chance to scan employee IDs as they walk by. These are all things that a penetration tester will do because it's similar to what an advanced persistent threat would do, but they generally have something called a get out of jail free card. Now, that is an agreement with the company where, provided they're doing things within a specific scope, they will not go to jail and the company will not press charges if they are caught. That's really important. And the primary difference between someone who's uh, actually a threat and somebody who's le a legitimate researcher or working in the industry. Now, um, penetration testers will also have limitations, which APT hackers will not. They'll have a specific scope for their contract. So you know, they can't spend a year infiltrating a target and lurking in their system waiting for the perfect moment to strike, because nobody has time for that. You know, they've got other things to do. They need to make money. Um, it doesn't make sense for them to use that tactic. They just don't have the resources to match a real attacker in that uh, scenario. Um, so again, per persistence is really a behavior of APTs. They break into a system and they linger for a long period of time. Um, somebody who's simulating an APT may not have time to do that and will have to do sort of an abridged version of that sort of attack. Um, so 
while these tactics are cutting edge, again, like the scope of legality is really where you get into trouble when you're trying to simulate them. Uh, trying to get in touch with executives, for example, is a really common exception in a, like a security contract where they would say, okay, we want to, you to test our company against phishing, except do not go after top level executives, do not go after our CEO, do not go after, you know, they have lists of exceptions or lists of things you're not allowed to do because they think it would be too disruptive to the business, which really kind of prevents you from actually trying these techniques. Um, so I'll skip that video for now. If you guys want to check it out, that's actually a really good video on uh, you can just watch hackers break into the US power grid. It's an example of how some real penetration testers called Red Teams um, are able to test American infrastructure and see how incredibly vulnerable um, some of these sites that rely on seemingly automated security really are, and sometimes physical security. So qualities of an APT hacking group are long-term planning and patience. Again, they'll wait for very long periods of time to actually roll out these plans. If you look at the period of time spent planning and conducting reconnaissance versus actually taking action on a target, it's very, very large in terms of uh, the amount of time invested in just knowing what your target is and planning the perfect strike. Now, if you're thinking about this uh, like a programmer, like you need to understand the situation perfectly in order to write the most efficient code. So in this case, we're gathering uh, technical and non-technical information in order to write the most efficient exploit to get to whatever our objective is. Now, um, big picture thinking, again, is something that defines an APT. Uh, a lower level hacker will go after something that's easy to achieve, and somebody who's involved in a more well-resourced group will have, let's say, a political goal, or uh, an, something to do with organized crime that, where they want to like, actually move a very large amount of money, and they'll need to accomplish a number of small objectives in order to uh, get closer to that goal. Social engineering is also an important part of any APT methodology. It is not efficient to go after the full-fledged security of an organization. It is better to go after the individual members of an organization because they are weaker uh, when you go after you know, things that they might not be good at. Now, um, a, an example I can share is in the fashion industry, it's very kind of stereotypical that people are not good at security. So when you go after a business in the, in the fashion district, the number one attack you'll see executed is a phishing attack. This is because the, the people in that industry generally are, are under, stereotype to not be very good at being able to tell when something's bad or like if it might be suspicious because they're not as familiar with uh, technology. Fashion really isn't something you go into if you're you know, into technology. So as a result, we see a disproportionate amount of attacks against those businesses that are based on simply clicking, uh, tricking them into clicking on a fake link, a piece of malware. In particular, we saw a shipping company that was breached and then sent out emails looking like an invoice to all the companies they had ever worked with. Uh, and all, virtually all of those companies opened those emails and ended up getting breached. So if you're looking to uh, really get into a whole lot of or like industry scale uh, computers, you know, breaking into one system is not where you want to start unless you have a plan that's going to take you, uh, you know, all the way towards compromising a whole bunch of businesses and making you a lot more money. Um, so discretion is something that defines an APT hacking group. You don't want to get caught if you're a professional. Um, people that want glory, who want attention, uh, they are not the same kind of people as a sort of group. Now the reason that an APT group uses discretion is because if you're going to stage an attack against a company and you're a well-resourced group, you have two options. You can use your crazy supercomputer that only three nations besides you have and make it super obvious that you are the only one that could pull off that sort of attack, or you could spend $35 and attack from something like a Raspberry Pi. And something like this is perfectly capable of running a, a majority of attacks you would want to run from even a, a decent laptop. This can still do a lot of them, and because anybody could buy them, including a you know, broke college student, it's difficult to tell if a nation state or you know, some 13-year-old kid is attacking you if they're using something that anybody can buy. Now that same thing goes to uh, zero-day exploits and other things that might be uh, too expensive or too difficult to uh, get for most people to use. They actually tend to shy away from using those, even though they have access to them, because they want to create a pattern that's misleading. Um, the tools that you use to hack uh, a business or an organization, the way you go about conducting your reconnaissance, that is a fingerprint. And that's what's used to identify these groups because depending on their level of technical skill and resource, they will either always pick the same things because it's all they have to work with, or if they're really well resourced, they'll pick things that make it look like uh, somebody else did it. So well-resourced organizations will have giant you know, toolkits where they can pick whatever they want, and they'll look on the internet and find individual hackers that have a, a particular pattern. So they'll just pick the same tools if it happens to suit the purpose and, in effect, create a, a situation where it looks like somebody else did it. 
So that's kind of the signature of an APT hacker. Like you, you don't want to know who they are. They will generally either pretend to be someone else or they will adopt the techniques of another nation, for example, uh, in order to kind of misdirect people that are trying to attribute it. Now an example that's been in the news lately is, uh, I read this I think yesterday, uh, a Russian intelligence officer was, um, ident was supposedly identified as being uh, linked to the Guccifer 2.0 personality, which was uh, the, the hacker who was accused of breaching the uh, Democratic National uh, Convention Committee, whatever. Uh, so what happened with that was somebody broke in, stole this data, and was brokering it, and was pretending to be a Romanian hacker um, who uh, staged a couple interviews and was trying to like build this persona, but did a really bad job, and in an interview with a motherboard wasn't able to speak Romanian at all. Uh, but they were able, able to speak Russian. So eventually, uh, evidence came to light that they connected without using their usual VPN, and it was something in Moscow. But there was a tremendous amount of effort to make it look like it was a Romanian hacker that was going and doing all these things for personal reasons or political reasons, rather than uh, you know, an APT group that was actually kind of pulling the string behind this operation. So that's pretty typical. If you go in and try to break someone else's stuff or do something bad, like you don't want it to come back on your country. So uh, the majority of times, uh, APT groups will either use a proxy organization, like say another hacker that's already broken in that they know about, or they will adopt the techniques of another group in order to, um, to not uh, appear to be the ones who are responsible. So the other thing is APTs target the weakest link. That is not usually the technology of an organization. It is usually the way the technology is implemented or the people working in the organization. What that means is if you have staff that is poorly trained, if you have people that make exceptions in security policies, if you have people that are willing to give out the Wi-Fi password to literally anyone, those are the weakest link of your organization. And you can have the best security, the best antivirus, and the best everything, but if the people carrying out your day-to-day -day activities are really bad at what they do, they are the weakest link. Now, APTs understand this, and that's why social engineering is such a core part of what they do. Part of the reconnaissance process is non-technical data, and that includes information about the people involved in organizations, not just the technology behind them. So the cyber kill chain is a dramatically named concept uh, by Lockheed Martin, which uh, does specialize in uh, things like uh, cybersecurity, and that's one of the things they do since they're a government contractor. And it shows a kind of an efficient way for you guys to visualize the sorts of uh, the steps of uh, what an attacker needs to accomplish in order to pull off something like what we're talking about. So the first, as we've gone over before, is reconnaissance. And that's harvesting everything from email addresses, domains that the company owns, links that you would find between particular businesses and particular individuals, and build, <clears throat> build as complete a picture as possible of the, uh, I guess, the, the target surface that you're looking at. So what that means is understanding everything the company owns, the people who are involved, uh, Anyone who might present a tempting target down the road if you needed to get into a particular system. This also means identifying physical facilities, identifying servers owned, identifying service agreements between uh, that company and other companies that might offer them you know, security, for example. Those are all things that go into reconnaissance, which can be broken into two different types, active and passive, and we'll get into that next. So the next is weaponization. Once you understand the target surface, you can design an attack that is basically uh, designed to go after the weakest link and allow you to uh, basically get a, a beachhead or, or a, what's a, a lily pad, I think is one way that, that I've heard it called, um, into the network. And that's an initial, an initial uh, computer that you've breached that you are using to kind of use as a beachhead and spread your influence across the network or elevate uh, your privileges, maybe even uh, install malware. So delivery is the method through which you trick somebody into uh, running the program that you've weaponized. So if you know that they use a particular um, operating system and you create an exploit that is designed to uh, get you a presence on that operating system so you can take the next step, the way that you would deliver that is either physical, so you could walk in and have a USB stick that's designed to run that as soon as you plug it in, you can trick somebody into opening a phishing email that makes it look like a, an invoice, for example, that they're expected to pay, that they're like, I don't know anything, and they open it to see what it's about, especially if you've uh, breached someone, maybe another business that they work with that has terrible security, but they trust. That's important. Human trust is one of the things that APTs target. So in the delivery phase, we often look at people or organizations that a business would trust enough to open an email that looks maybe even a little bit suspicious. Now we know that we're not supposed to open emails from strangers or random people, but what about from your friends? 
Now, if you're an, an important executive at a company, like this is actually something you need to worry about. It's called whaling, and it's a really t popular technique for breaking into a, a, a large business. You go after the executives. Um, you look at them and you make them your primary focus. So if you breach one of them, you can use their trust and influence within the company to make a lot of stuff happen that you would never be able to do with just a technical exploit. So the next is exploitation. Once you actually uh, run your program on their computer, you need to have it exploit it so that you can have a persistent presence and begin the installation process, which is where you actually load the tools that you'll be using to accomplish your objective. Now this is some sort of malware, usually a framework or something else that automates the task that you'll be doing, and it will also be some sort of program to achieve the next step, which is command and control. So if you're an APT, you're not just dropping malware onto a system and walking away. Um, that is what uh, I think the, the WannaCry um, virus, uh, never mind, it actually did have command and control. I'll, I'll walk that back. But some programs do are just a virus that might drop onto the system, encrypt everything, and then that's it. That is not the kind of malware that an APT typically uses. Command and control is an important part because it allows you to monitor the status of what you've done, and it also allows you to execute various objectives on the target, that being uh, various things that you need to do. Those will usually be a module within this framework that you load, and then it will report back to a command and control server of the status of the, the various uh, payloads you've attempted to run, and then how far along uh, you are within you know, whatever your plan is. So there are all different, all sorts of ways to communicate with a program that's running on a compromised computer. Back in the day, you could use an IRC chat server where you just type commands and all of your bots would like reply back to you. And you can use a very simple framework to control a whole bunch of computers at the same time. Uh, so the next is uh, action on the objective. And that's kind of the final step. That's where once you're inside the system, you have a presence and you have the ability to control the malware that you've implanted. You actually do the stuff that you want to do, which will typically involve everything from uh, stealing files, encrypting things, um, and then erasing your presence on the network when you're done. So we're going to go into a couple elements of APT attacks. Uh, the first being, again, reconnaissance. Uh, reconnaissance is the most important factor of any APT attack. It's where we take all the information, analyze it, and split it between non-technical data and technical data, and kind of start focusing on those separately. So social spear phishing is uh, where we go after high priority targets that are likely to be exploitable and have some sort of access to the organization. So these are CEOs, people uh, with special clearance, uh, people with special abilities that it would be advantageous to have the same rights as, basically. Um, so this can be things like breaking into their email, um, breaking into messaging systems, using USB drives to uh, break into their uh, various accounts. Um, this is things like leaving a USB drive in a pen cup uh, with the logo of the organization on it and waiting for somebody to find it and plug it into a computer. Um, these various tactics you can use to trick people into doing stuff that they know perfectly well that they're not supposed to do. But they'll, they'll do it and can provide you with credentials that you can uh, use to get deeper into the network. So remote and wireless is kind of my specialty, and that's one thing that we're going to be talking about towards the end of this presentation today. Uh, remote and wireless communications are relatively easy to sniff. Um, I have a series of, on Wi-Fi cracking that kind of goes into how easy it is to break into these sorts of networks, but they supply a tremendous amount of data. And we'll go into also the way that the CIA actually does this on a very high level, uh, again, towards the end of the presentation today. So wireless networks are easy to um, conduct certain types of surveillance against in order to tell whether, for example, a user is there or not, what particular device they're using, or if they're connected to a network or not, which can let us know when a user comes and goes in an, a way that's completely automated and doesn't require us to actually be there, sitting there watching them. Um, another type of attack is the hardware spear phishing attack. So there are purpose-built devices that are basically designed just for hacking, and I have an example of one here. Um, the one that you see on the screen is a USB rubber ducky. Uh, we have a number of these already for uh, the company I work for, and we're trying to actually get you guys some as well uh, for this class so you can learn to program them and the way that they actually work. Now, the way that this device works is it's called an HID attack, a human interface device attack. And you program instructions as though, but you can think about it like you're sitting behind the computer. You need to put in some instructions in order to do a certain thing, whatever it is you want to do. You record those instructions onto the SD card, in the uh, micro SD card in the USB rubber ducky. And then when you plug it into the victim's computer, it, it executes all those steps very, very quickly. So the advantage of this is if you've ever walked into any, let's say, a medical office and seen them with a, like a you know, monitor in front of you that has a USB port facing you, it would take literally five seconds to exploit that computer if they were to turn around in response to, I don't know, a phone call from you calling on your cell phone or something like that. 
In order to use a device like this to control a computer, you need to know a little bit of information about the device that you're trying to exploit, which is where reconnaissance comes in. And once you know that information, you can use it to write a program or write some sort of payload that when you plug it in, automatically expo exploits the computer and gives the ability to basically get into any computer you have physical access to. Now, physical access is the keyword here. Anytime you have physical access, you can use a device like that or something like this, which is a packet squirrel. This is designed to uh, basically place a backdoor in a network. And if you place it into a, uh, like a, a network switch or something like that right in front of where it goes into the router, this will persistently sit there and send you all of the information about what's going on in the network and even start to do things like steal passwords. Now, this is a really, really good uh, way of getting information if you have limited physical access, maybe for a couple seconds, and then you want to uh, be able to get back in later. Uh, this sort of tool is really, really helpful for any hacker that has the ability to buy them because it lets you take the time and energy you put into reconnaissance and put, kind of put it towards an elegant attack that only takes a couple seconds to execute. Now, uh, that also goes into physical infiltration, and that's where skills like lockpicking uh, and the ability to uh, you know, knock out a security camera that relies on Wi-Fi come into play. Now, physical infiltration is when you will do something like cloning a, an a RFID security badge in order to get into a, like a locked business after business hours, or other sorts of uh, like collection of credentials so that you can get around security systems and basically get access to things that you're supposed to be physically kept away from. This is also where we get into studying like building designs that use things like elevators as access control, and we can sort of see why those are bad ideas uh, sometimes. So offensive recon and offensive research works by dividing things into technical and non-technical data. So to explain what that is, uh, technical data is things like IP addresses and hosting, which are, you can just run a who is uh, command usually and get that sort of information. Software and operating systems used with target. Um, there's actually a, a Chrome plugin called Built With that any website that, you can, uh, any website you go on, you can press uh, the built with icon and it will give you a complete breakdown of all the technology and all the software that website uses in order to exist. So by doing things like that, you can tell what hosting service they use, what email address service they use, uh, like you can tell if they use a, like a Gmail service or a Zoho service or some other sort of like email service, Yahoo email service. Um, these sorts of uh, collections of data do not require you to interact with the target in order to get. So there's a very low, almost zero chance that you'll be t detected uh, collecting this sort of information. Now, non-technical information is things like uh, positions and contact information of executives, uh, anybody that would have special access to a company. Now, there's a program called the Harvester and the Operative Framework, which are both Python programs that automate this process and allow you to collect information about individuals who might be associated with the company. Um, security contracts that the company has with third-party providers. You can use um, things like Multego to pull up information, even company filings, uh, tax filings, like, and other things that might be relevant to what you're looking into. And then business filings and company, and even the signatures of executives can all be found just by searching things like the Secretary of State's uh, business filings. So this is where we get into uh, open source uh, intelligence as well. And we start to look at different sources that businesses generate just by existing and how we can sort of use those to learn more about uh, the non-technical data of an uh, organization we might want to attack. So again, when we talk about recon, we have two different types, active and passive. And it's important to know the difference between these two because active can get you caught and passive is generally safe. So passive methods do not require you to interact directly with the target. So that means a who is query, um, Wi-Fi signals intelligence, basically walking close to a target and recording Wi-Fi information and kind of interpreting it. War driving, which is when you add a GPS to that and drive around so you can find weak wireless networks uh, by tagging the GPS information and saving it to a log. And then it basically it maps it so you can go back and later find uh, any wireless network you've driven or walked by. And then using uh, tools like Multego, uh, which pulls vast amount of data from APIs, sorts it and then shows relationships between the information so you can start to find uh, and, and dig for details or, or clues as to uh, more information uh, than a business might publicly disclose. So active methods require you to interact with the target to gain information about it. And they can include things like grabbing a WPA handshake that would allow you to break into a network, uh, phishing in order to get credentials, uh, creating a, well, that's actually more of a tap, but uh, creating a fake network in order to unmask users and, and see if they'll connect it so you can basically track their MAC address or directly port scanning devices or websites. So that means you're actually reaching out and touching um, the server that they own or going to the business that they, they work at. That's a lot more active and the risk of getting caught is significantly more. 
So Wi-Fi surveillance is one of my favorite methods of uh, reconnaissance, and I'm going to go a little bit into that uh, towards the end of today, just so you have kind of a, a deep dive into how serious this stuff can get and the real potential of this sort of, uh, this sort of information and harvesting it. So Wi-Fi surveillance is a really excellent way of gathering information about people, the devices they use, and human behavior. And the CIA knows this, so they operated a program called Cherry Blossom. So Cherry Blossom is honestly amazing. Um, it's also kind of horrible. Uh, what they would do is they would take routers and they would basically break into them and load custom firmware that turned them into spy devices that were accountable only to the CIA. So once they broke into this router, and there was a number of different ways you could do this, you would be able to remotely connect to it. And you can actually see this is the command and control screen right here. Um, and through this nice little portal, you can just click on various exploited routers and see the logs of all the information that has passed through them, as well as run modules on them, just like malware. I mean, this basically is malware. Uh, when you have that ability, you can not only mass surveil a tremendous amount of people just by infecting their routers and using them to watch them, but you can also watch and attack their neighbors. Because if you have somebody next to the business that you want to attack who happens to be vulnerable, the weakest link might not actually be the business you're trying to attack. It could just be their neighbor. If you're able to, let's say, exploit a router that's right next to the person you want to spy on, you don't actually need to be there anymore because now you have a device that you can remotely control to do all the things that you wanted to do to the router in the first place. So things like Cherry Blossom, which this is a, an example of how it works, you basically have a, a wireless device that has been compromised, a router that has been infected with a, this malware uh, called a flytrap. That flytrap connects through the internet to a gateway and is controlled by a command post called Cherry Tree. Now the Cherry Tree uh, network is right here, and this, they have this nice remote terminal called the Cherry Web, which is the HTML uh, actual interface, and that allows you to directly control thousands, potentially, of different routers that have been compromised in order to spy on their users and the people nearby. So this is a very, very advanced way of doing this. We don't need to go that hard. Uh, but it shows that you can scale the sort of surveillance so that you're not just talking about one-on-one, -on -one, you know, I'm watching one network. We can watch an entire neighborhood. We could watch an entire city. We could really expand this to be able to even track individual users as they walk around. Because when we chain this data together, we start developing uh, points of information that can all be kind of sourced into one file. And you can kind of think of it like the license plate scanners in Los Angeles. Um, if you just drive by a license plate scanner once and it records your license plate, the place, and the time, that's probably fine. But if you have one of those every block, you create a situation where you actually are being tracked all the time. So the more points of information you have in a situation like this, the more persistent and the more creepy, really, you can be. Uh, so one of the things we'll kind of look at is how we can start from the beginning and just record a little bit of data and then scale it up until we can start to tell a lot about human behavior just by doing something like being nearby. So again, we don't need to get as hard as, uh, as go as hard as the CIA does. That's unnecessary. But we can look at a couple of the qualities of Wi-Fi to make some friends with strangers and understand a little bit about how we can learn about even somebody in this room without knowing a single thing about them. So passive recon starts by, uh, when it comes to Wi-Fi anyway, path starts by identifying and tagging users so you can track and follow them. Now, one thing that happens is cell phones will randomize their MAC address so it's more difficult to track them in this way because companies basically do that all the time. Walmart does this in order to sell more expensive spaces in their stores because they track to see where you go uh, via your, uh, like the card in your phone. And they can tell when you get closer to certain aisles, so they'll sell the, the space on those aisles to manufacturers for more. So because everybody is in the surveillance game now, even commercial people, most cell phones will randomize their MAC address periodically, but you can get around this pretty easily. Uh, so we can very quickly fingerprint things like laptops or computers that don't randomize their MAC address. But if we want to take a step into active surveillance or active um, uh, reconnaissance, we can do things like create a fake wireless network. And you can test this for yourselves by, uh, if your phone lets you generate a, a, a hotspot, you can type Google Starbucks, go into a crowd, have no password, and see how many phones connect to you. You will be shocked. And when they connect to you, they connect with their real MAC address, which allows you to actually track them anytime they connect to Wi-Fi. You could drive by their house and be looking for that MAC address and find them just because you're able to grab that MAC address by tricking their phone into dropping its fake one. So you can use easy tricks like this in order to get around some of the systems that people try to uh, use to keep uh, people anonymous. And you can end up really being able to track people a lot more than anyone might think just by having that person having their uh, wireless card on. That's just they forget to turn it off. 
So um, we can also use probe frames from phones and devices that are not connected to a wireless network to tell us where they live. Now that's interesting because if you have a wireless network that's uniquely named or uniquely named enough, or if you can filter it by location, you might know where they, the general city they live in, I could be sitting on the subway in Los Angeles and be listening on my wireless card for uh, devices that are not connected to a network, but looking for the last network that they connected to. So most devices, when they're looking for a new network, will uh, basically call out an unencrypted plain text saying, hey, is this network I just connected to still here? And some older devices will actually list like five, sometimes seven things that they've been to. So if you are sitting on a, a bus, for example, maybe a train, something like that, you'll just see un disconnected devices that are trying to find the best Western Inn in the Grand Canyon. Like, and you'll see, it was like, all right, someone's been to the Grand Canyon, they stay at this hotel, their home Wi-Fi network is probably this, and it looks like their work network is this. And the interesting thing is you can use tools like wiggle.net, which is a war driving thing where tons of people contribute data about wireless networks. This is uh, Pasadena, actually. This is a map of all the wireless networks that have been recorded uh, in Pasadena, some by me, uh, and some by other people. Um, and every single one of these is, a, is basically a router or another device that's creating a wireless hotspot or an access point. So you can think of this like um, the Google Maps uh, or the Google Street View of Wi-Fi hacking. You can drop yourself into one of these areas and see if there's a, a vulnerable router there before you even go. You can also walk around with, your, with an Android phone and build your own database of this information, which I can give you, show you guys some sample of data of what it looks like, but it's just a CSV data file that has all this information about the router, including its physical location, which allows you to build a map like this. So if we're looking for where someone lives and we have their device nearby calling out the name of a wireless network, we can take the name of that network, drop it into Wiggle, and do a search for the SSID here, and we can get their address. That's pretty intense. Building a link between someone's physical address or their work's physical address just by the signal that their phone is giving off when they're sitting there and they're not aware of that is a really intense example of how you can build links to conduct uh, the kind of reconnaissance that most people might think is impossible just by being near someone. So that's what I'm gonna, all I'm going to go into today. I recommend you guys check out wiggle.net. And if you have an Android phone, uh, look at the Wiggle app. It will allow you to, let's say, if you were to walk around a building, collect every single wireless uh, device in that building, including disconnected devices, and build a database of all those things that you can actually go back. And if you know a little bit about programming, you can slice through that information and learn a lot about maybe every weak network in a particular building, in a particular city, really whatever you have time for. Uh, so we'll go a little bit more into wireless reconnaissance next time. Uh, we'll talk about what you can do with a Wi-Fi card uh, with monitor mode and how powerful that can be. And we'll also do perhaps a demo of how easy it is to get devices to connect to you and learn about them um, just kind of out in public. So all right, that's it for today. Uh, thanks, and we'll see you guys next time.